So we were discussing about how to approximate dynamic programming, given that it's a very important algorithm, but it's also very complex. So the question was that we were pondering about before Thanksgiving break was how do we uh, approximate a dynamic program so that it becomes easier to solve on a computer, right? And we had a few ideas, which was to reduce the size of X by using what we call quantization or state aggregation or uh, principal component analysis, PCA. Okay, so that was the first idea we had talked about. Then the second point was uh, simplifying the transition function. Simplify FT and CT using principles uh, of physics or chemistry or biology. Okay, depending on what kind of system you're looking at. And then the third part uh, that we talked about was, let me call it 3A, which was more about how would you store a function so store vt slash gamma t using um, uh, function approximators. Right, and some of the function approximators we talked about was uh, neural network and uh, Fourier series and so on. But more generally, if you are very interested in this particular topic, uh, you should read about non-parametric regression. And you should read about support vector machines. So these two topics are typically studied heavily either in statistics or in uh, machine learning community. And there is a wealth of knowledge about non-parametric regression and support vector machines in these communities. So if you pick up any standard text in machine learning, or you could look at uh, standard textbooks on non-parametric non regression or support vector machines, and you will find a lot of information about function approximators. And that can give you some idea, given the problem you are solving, it can give you some idea about what kind of function approximator you should choose for storing the value function or your policy function. And then the 3B was, remember that the expression for VT is given by BT, the iterated operation of Bellman operator, uh, so you, you iterate the Bellman operator all the way until the final time step, right? So that was the way to get the value function. And then gamma T was basically argmin of u in u, c of gamma t of xt, c of xt ut plus vt plus one composition ft of xt comma ut. Okay, so all of us understand that uh, the first three things is something that we have already discussed in the previous lecture. Uh, and today we are going to talk about, so this part, I think everyone understands once you have the value function and you know the state transition function, this minimization can be performed either using a tabular method or you could use gradient descent type methods to solve this argument problem. And then you can store it using, store the gamma t using uh, any of the, non-parametric regression or support vector machine based uh, function approximator. So what we are going to talk about today, and it's going to take a bulk of our time today, is simplification of this particular computation. So remember, in order to compute VT, you have to iterate the application of Bellman operator so many times, 
okay and if supposing the t capital t is very large then doing this computation will take a long time okay so if t is large how would you simplify this iterative application of the bellman operator so let's let's think about it what else can what else can we do so we have already done the first three things which is we have reduced the state space using different method different methodologies we have simplified the state and transition function and the cost function um, we have also come up with a nice function approximator for our value function and policy function we have picked a function approximating class for that now the question is i'm still i still have to in order to compute vt i still have to iteratively apply this bellman operator and my t is very very large t could be infinity or t could be really very really large of the order of a million or a billion so what kind of stuff i can try to minimize the computation for these iterations what do you think I'm looking for ideas. My T is 1 billion. So in order to compute, and I need to start at time zero, I need to figure out how do I behave at time zero. And it requires me to go through 1 billion applications of the Bellman operator in order to start acting at time zero, uh, which seems like a very, very complicated task. So how would I go about solving this? Any thoughts? I want you guys to think about it and tell me what, what can you do? You, you come to my company and, and I give you this problem. What are you going to try first? You make a big T smaller. Make a big T. So how would you make it smaller? Uh, maybe not have as many time steps. Good, good, good. I, I like the idea. So, so tell me what my new V tilde T is going to look like. Let's say I'm start, starting at zero. So what should my V tilde zero look like? That's right. So T is one, 10 raised to nine, a billion. And you are saying that I should not really consider those many time steps. So what should I do? Could you do like B, uh, B0, B10, B, um, B100? Yeah, whatever, B100, then what? What should I put in the bracket? Mm -hmm. So here, let me recall, here I have put the terminal cost at the end of BT minus one. What should I put here? So typically, of course, you would put V101 if you knew, knew exactly what V101 is. But the fact is you haven't really done the comp computation. So you don't know what V101 is. Okay, so we don't know V101. So what do I do? What's the simplest function you know of? Simplest function of state. Identity? Well, identity, yeah, it's simple, but zero is even simpler. 
<laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So you put a zero function here, and this is known as a rolling horizon approach. This is rolling horizon. Uh, so rolling horizon algorithm is that you pick a horizon length h. So in this case, my h was equal to 100, but you can really pick h to be any number that you deem fit for your application. And then at every point of time, you compute v tilde t by, by applying bt all the way to bt plus h of zero function. Okay, so you only apply h iterations of the Bellman operator uh, to and the terminal cost is zero. So you kind of replace your V101 with a terminal cost of zero and that's your uh, rolling horizon control. And then you can determine your gamma T star or whatever your gamma tilde T, which is an approximately optimal policy using the argument of CT plus V tilde T plus one composition FT. Okay, and this is known as rolling horizon control. The idea is, as one of your friends rightly pointed out, you truncate the iteration of Bellman operator and you add a terminal cost of zero function and, and you just solve the problem in this way. And this kind of approach really works. Uh, actually, let me say why this approach fails. So this approach fails if bulk of the cost is terminal cost right so let's say i'm i'm standing at earth here that i have i have a rocket looks like a rocket i think and here is a here is moon and i want to reach this place and I don't care anything about the intermediate cost. All I care about is I want to reach this terminal point on the moon. So this is earth, this is moon. And so you actually have a terminal cost problem where CT of XT is XT minus YT, sorry, XT minus this Y square. This is the point Y in space. Okay, and this is my X zero. So I want to reach y, so I use a terminal cost xt minus y square. So I want to get as close to y as possible, but my intermediate cost is zero. I'm not really picking a cost of my fuel and all that stuff. And if you apply this sort of approach, the rolling horizon approach with zero terminal cost, then the optimal solution will be, I mean, nothing because it will be zero, 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 all the way up to zero. So your V tilde T plus one, V tilde T, all of them will be equal to zero. And, and that makes it, that becomes a problem because then I, you don't quite know what you're trying to minimize because you don't have a zero cost. So the cost is zero, your V tilde T plus one is zero. So therefore you are doing your gamma tilde T could be anything like you can literally do anything because it doesn't affect your intermediate cost. So this kind of approach, the rolling horizon approach would fail if the bulk of the cost is ter terminal cost and your intermediate cost is like very, very small. Does that make sense? Yeah, so this is like having a window right over the time steps, right? Right, that's right, that's right. Okay. So that's why it's called rolling horizon. So the horizon is rolling at, as you progress, the horizon at which you're optimizing is different. And uh, okay. yeah, you can't apply it to a terminal cost problem. So a problem that you could apply this to would be something like uh, maybe like cruise control. That's right. That's right. Where... That's exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay. Because there the goal is to maintain the reference velocity or, or in adaptive cruise control where the goal is to maintain distance with the vehicle in front and maintain the reference velocity. And in those cases, the bulk of, there is no terminal cost. The bulk of the cost is your intermediate cost and therefore you can apply the rolling horizon approach and it will just work beautifully for that application. Great example. So can apply to adaptive cruise control in vehicles. 
actually this uh, sort of rolling horizon approach is used heavily in vehicles because in many applications the bulk of the cost is the recurring cost not the terminal cost like fuel consumption or noise and vibration and so on okay any question on the rolling horizon problem Ro rolling horizon um, approximation okay now my question is there are no questions on this rolling horizon stuff so now my question is can we do better than zero So I said, okay, fine. I mean, I I, I don't I haven't computed v101, right? I I don't know the value of v101, so I'm just going to put zero because that seems like an easy option. Now someone told me that oh, I have to go to the moon, and this is my terminal cost. And now I'm thinking, boy, I'm screwed because I really can't put a zero cost. It's just going to screw up my entire optimization routine what can we do how can we make things better can we set incremental goals like mm -hmm. um at say a or t equals 100 you want to be at a particular point right and then set that as the terminal goal okay um i think that works how do you come up with incremental goals uh, we might have a reference that we want to track so we might know uh after but how would you much... get the reference? That's the whole question. What is the optimal reference? Yeah, yeah. Right. So I'll, I'll let me give you an example. Say you want to go to Jupiter, okay, from Earth. So Earth to Moon is sort of an easy problem, but Earth to Jupiter is a more complicated problem. And typically what you do in those problems is you, uh, so it's, it's like an incremental goal type of approach that uh, your friend alluded to. So what you do is you typically go along the moon, then you go along Mars, and then you go along you know, uh, Saturn and so on. And then you get to Jupiter. And what happens every time the aircraft passes by one of these massive bodies, it gets a huge boost in the velocity due to what is known as slingshot effect. Um, I, I don't know if you've heard of slingshot effect, but you can look up Wikipedia about it. And so the inter incremental goal is, okay, I, I want to go to fly past moon because I know that once I do that, I'll get a boost in my velocity for free because I don't, I don't have to really spend any, any fuel in order to get that boost in velocity. All I have to do is just fly past moon uh, in the space. And uh, that's how people actually plan the trajectory to go to Jupiter or to go to Mars, for instance. Uh, they use the slingshot effect in order to get a boost in the velocity using intermediate planets or, or celestial bodies. Okay, so that's a good good example. Incremental goals is, is, is one way to do it. Uh, but perhaps it requires a lot of domain knowledge, right? I mean, given so many different dynamic programs we see in our daily life, um, it seems to me that the incremental goal would require a lot of domain knowledge for you to figure out how to do it. So the slingshot effect is very much astronomy uh, related stuff, which if you weren't a physicist or you weren't an uh, astrophysicist, you probably wouldn't know about slingshot effect. What else can we do? So this, this incremental goal seems to be very uh, domain dependent. But it's, a, it's still a good, good strategy. I mean, I'm not saying that it's not used. It's definitely used, but it's not general enough. Okay, so let's, let me tell you what the other algorithm is. 
is called rollout algorithm. And the idea in rollout algorithm is I have a heuristic. I have a, let me call the heuristic mu one to mu capital T minus one. This is a heuristic policy. So mu t is, it maps the state to the action. It's a heuristic policy. I kind of know that it works. It, it gets you to the goal. Uh, I have used it several times in the past and it just, uh, it's just a beautiful policy, but it's not optimal. I, I just know that it works, but it's not optimal. What you do is you compute the optimal cost to go JT with mu t to mu capital T minus one, which is summation of CT, XT, no, CS, XS, mu S, XS, S equals to T to capital T minus one. So this XS and XT, these are all generated from this policy mu S. Okay, so this is called cost to go function. Cost to go function. Okay, so what I do is I come up with a heuristic policy, which you know I've just learned from my superiors or from some prior experience that this kind of policy seems to work very well. And I compute what is known as the cost to go function. This, this is a function of X actually. Um, let me, sorry, I am going to write mu in the, as a superscript because it's computed using this heuristic policy. And this is a function of XT, okay? That's the, cost to go function. This is a function of the state at time T um, and it's under the heuristic mu. And what I do is I compute my V tilde T. This is done for all T. XT as um, BT composition, composition B T plus H, it's just like rolling horizon, but instead of writing V, instead of writing V T plus H, I'm going to write J mu T plus H plus one. Okay, so this is the cost to go with heuristic. Okay, now this heuristic is experience space, just like I had uh, mentioned in the previous case, where if you, if you have an intermediate goal, then that is sort of based on the experience, based on the domain knowledge. So you have some domain knowledge based on which you come up with a heuristic policy, and then you evaluate the heuristic policy, the cost to go under that heuristic policy, and use that instead of the value function uh, at the terminal time step, and you apply the Bellman operator iteratively. So this is also rolling horizon. You, as you can see, this H is your horizon length, capital H is your horizon length. So this is a rolling horizon approach, but instead of picking a zero terminal cost, um, you're picking a terminal cost according to some heuristic mu. Okay. And this is known as rollout algorithm. This is known as rollout algorithm. Any question on this rollout algorithm? Can you, can you give an example of what a, a heuristic might be? 
Right, good, good question. So when you are playing chess, the heuristic might be a heuristic that someone has coded, which kind of is a good heuristic for playing chess. Okay, so, so that's one. So basically rollout algorithm was actually designed to play chess uh, with an opponent. And this algorithm was actually used for uh, chess playing algorithms in 1990s. I mean, that's when it was developed and used for those stuff. Uh, uh, for playing games and it had very, very good performance. So now let me give you some examples of other technical systems where this could be useful. So going back to the, sorry, going back to this example, you're going from earth to moon and you want to land at a specific point in moon and you set the incremental goal, you come up with a trajectory which leads you to that particular point on moon and then that gives you a heuristic policy because now you have a way to actually trace this path and get to the planet moon. And based on this, you can come up with your cost to go approximation at every point of, point of time. And then you can use that for optimizing the trajectory of this particular rocket all the way to the moon. Okay, so that's one heuristic. Uh, in chess, you know, how do you play the chess? That's one heuristic. Uh, which is sort of designed by human beings based on their domain knowledge of how to play chess. Um, in the case of vehicle, we recently applied rollout algorithm where uh, we kind of know how to drive in no traffic setting because it's sort of very easy. Uh, I exactly know how to drive if there is no traffic on the road and all the traffic lights are green. Okay, so I, I just know how to drive the car in those situations because it's just very easy strategy. And I use that approach to optimize the fuel consumption in the vehicle. Okay, so we, so this, this cost, this mu is essentially, how would you drive if there was no traffic? That was our heuristic, base heuristic. And then based on that, we ran a rolling horizon approach in order to compute the value function and the corresponding optimal policy uh, based on this truncated horizon or rolling horizon approach with that heuristic mu, which is driving under no traffic setting. Um, what else could be a good heuristic uh, in... So another heuristic could be, how would you drive if, if all the traffic lights were red? Okay, so that would be another heuristic, uh, mu two, and you could instead of using how to drive when all the traffic lights are green and there is no traffic, you could instead say, uh, you know what? Uh, I don't want to use that heuristic. Instead, I want to use the heuristic where all traffic lights are red and there is no traffic on the road. And I'm going to use that policy as the base heuristic in order to compute the cost to go function and execute this rollout algorithm. Does that give you some examples? Yeah. Um... But those are, those are all domain specific, right? They right. require domain knowledge. That's right. That's okay. right. Yeah. Didn't we say that was the problem with doing the incremental, um, like the incremental goals? Didn't we say the problem was that it required too much domain knowledge? That's right. So it requires domain knowledge. And I'm going to use that domain knowledge in order to come up with a heuristic policy. And now I have a general framework. So now I can... I can go across different. So this is the general framework that you were trying to get to, but you didn't know how to set the incremental goals and figure out. No, I don't want to say that. I want to say that with the domain knowledge, you can set the incremental goals, like the goals that you have to follow on the midpoint. But that itself is not a good policy. You can actually further optimize on top of that by using this rollout algorithm. So there is domain knowledge in coming up with heuristic, but you can actually but this particular algorithm is actually a what should I say? It's a theoretically proven algorithm. So it doesn't um, how should I say it? So there is something called policy iteration algorithm in MDP. 
and policy iteration algorithm is actually a roll out algorithm and so you you can basically come up with very very different types of um uh, you can come up with uh, so i'm trying to come up with a better word for this so you can use the domain knowledge to come up with this heuristic policy but actually you don't really need a domain knowledge to come up with heuristic policy uh so oh yeah let me say it this way you have good heuristic and bad heuristic right uh, a good heuristic would come from domain knowledge but you can even use a bad heuristic which doesn't come from domain knowledge you just pick some random policy and you can apply this roll out algorithm using that particular policy you, you, do you see what i'm saying mm -hmm. as long as it does so if you have better heuristic you will get a much better algorithm a much better output of this particular roll out algorithm if you have a bad heuristic you will get a bad algorithm now whether you get good heuristic through domain knowledge or whether you get good heuristic through some other means like policy iteration algorithm uh you typically get better and better policy as time progresses so this is like far more general than using just the domain knowledge does that help you understand this policy yeah yeah thanks okay yeah so a good heuristic would come from domain knowledge but you could use any heuristic policy you don't necessarily have to have domain knowledge for executing roll out algorithm and many a times you would run different heuristics and you would do the testing based on different heuristic and different execution of roll out algorithm and you will pick whatever works best for that system so so that i think is a better way to say this yeah that's a good question uh, professor yeah uh, so uh, by using a heuristic we got the xt uh, a trajectory that uh, we are using so are we trying to follow the trajectory or uh, whatever our gamma uh, ga uh, sorry uh, the control policy we will get right. by uh, minimization will it will be give a different trajectory or the same one right so let's say this is your xt so this xt is this vertical line and this is time t and this is time capital t and for every xt you will apply the heuristic and this is your trajectory okay this is the trajectory under mu this is the trajectory under mu this is the trajectory under mu so for every starting point and for every possible so for every time for every point xt under the influence of this heuristic you will have accumulated some cost and you are going to store it as jt mu of xt okay okay so what was your question sorry i forgot the question uh, so like we will uh, we are we are going from small t to the capital t uh, right. we have some trajectory right uh, so when we will do the minimization of the cost so will we be following that same trajectory or our trajectory will be different uh, so you are not minimizing the cost here right you are just getting the cost to go under the heuristic mu for every possible starting state in xt right so you're you're computing this this cost to go and then you apply roll out so this would be let's say time well t minus h let me write t minus h so so you get the terminal cost using this heuristic and then after that you are doing dynamic programming okay then you apply dp here okay dp here so what you are saying is i'm going to use dp uh until i hit this particular time step and after that i'm just going to use the heuristic i'm not going to do dp at all until the end of the horizon okay okay now understood right right so dp is being used in this region and there is no dp in this region okay yeah okay any other question
Okay, so this is uh, known as rollout algorithm. Um, and I want to talk about a third method, which is the reinforcement learning method. And the idea in reinforcement learning is a bunch of stuff. So the first thing is uh, you basically use function approximator use function approximator for VT for storing VT. Now there is always some loss uh, when you are approximating a function using some other function, then there will always be some loss. So let's say your original function looks like this and you used some function approximator to store VT and that function looks something like this. Well, let me draw it in a different color. So this is your original VT. This is your approximated VT, which is coming from some function approximator. And so there is always some loss in this particular function approximation, but nonetheless, you're using function approximator for storing VT. So that's one thing, one key feature of reinforcement learning. The second key feature of reinforcement learning is instead of uh, using the Bellman operator, you don't really use a Bellman operator, you uh, use some approximation, some simulation based approximation of uh, the Bellman operator. So your BT, so remember your BT of VT plus one is actually given by minimum U in U CT plus VT plus one composition FT, right? And uh, in this case, you of course replace this VT plus one with V tilde T plus one. So that's one approximation because you can't store the original value function. So use some function approximator to store it. And, uh, and you, you come up with some way to approximate this minimization. Okay, there are many ways to approximate it. So I don't want to go into it, but there are some ways, many ways to approximate this minimization stuff. And you particularly use some simulation device in order to come up with that approximation, the approximate minimum. And that is the second key component of reinforcement learning. And the third key component of reinforcement learning is the rollout algorithm. So you have done first approximation in function approximation, you have done second approximation is in doing this minimization. And then in the third approximation, instead of looking at the entire horizon, you're actually picking a horizon length of H and then you are you're applying the rollout algorithm on V tilde T plus H. So V tilde T so so V tilde T would be V tilde T composition V tilde T plus H V tilde T plus H plus one. So you can see there is an approximation here. There is an approximation in the Bellman operator here. And then there is an approximation in the horizon length here, because you're not looking at the, you, you're not letting H go to all the way until the terminal time. You're just truncating it at some point of time. And then you are running this uh, finite horizon DP, like a smaller horizon DP. And 
and, and this field reinforcement learning just on the basis of these three ideas has become a huge success in the past decade. And as you can see, it basically incorporates everything that we have studied so far uh, in order to make the whole thing work. And the success of the reinforcement learning is typically has been, I mean, if you, of course, if you're doing research in reinforcement learning, you can read a lot of stuff where success has been shown uh, in using this reinforcement learning based approach in, for deriving approximately optimal control strategy. And it is sort of revolutionizing many, many different fields and many, many different applications. Uh, the most prominent of which I believe is the data center energy of efficiency application that was demonstrated by DeepMind for Google's uh, data center. Uh, but there are many more. Uh, there are game playing softwares that have been developed using reinforcement learning. And there are uh, uh, robotic applications that people have studied using reinforcement learning and so on. Um, recommendation engines, when you watch Netflix or Amazon Prime or whatever, many of the recommendation engines have been trained using reinforcement learning approach. So completely data-driven approach. Um, and the basis of those algorithms is actually these three stuff that you see on the, on the screen, which is using function approximation, using simulation or data-based approximation for Bellman operator and using rollout algorithm. Apply these three things and you really can get a lot of, you can derive a lot of benefit in a wide variety of industrial settings um, in, the, in the real world. So that's all I have on uh, approximating dynamic programming. Uh, any questions on this reinforcement learning based approach? Have any of you heard of reinforcement learning before? No? Yes. I've, I've heard of it, but um, I guess I'm trying to connect what I've heard about it to what we have here. My understanding was like, you have a simulation that keeps trying different things, right? And then there's a reward, um, right? On the function, and then it keeps trying it out until it maximizes the reward. That, right. That's the approximation of the Bellman operator stuff that you you're talking about. So you have the reward is replaced with cost here, and then you're somehow using the function approximator and some sort of approximate Bellman operator to do the multiple simulations and doing this minimization. So instead of minimizing oh, yeah. using gradient descent, because that's difficult, what you're doing is running multiple simulations and doing the minimization using some approximate method. So that's what oh, you were okay. talking about, um, you know, but, but there are a lot of complexity because you have to choose a function approximator and you also have to run the rollout algorithm because you can't really ap apply the Bellman operator all the way to the end of the horizon because typically the horizon length could be a billion or a trillion long and that's too too long you you can't run dp of that magnitude okay yeah yeah so in the simulation then uh each time it's going through it's kind of running uh like at each time step it's running through all the different possible actions that's right and okay. it's running a much smaller horizon dp maybe two step four step five step dp so the simulations that you're talking about, it's basically running like five step simulation or 10 step simulation or 20 step or a hundred step simulation. And then approximating this Bellman operator based on the data from that simulation. So if you're interested in reinforcement learning, you should check out my, my course EC8851, the videos of which are on YouTube. Um, uh, it I, I taught it in SP2020, so about six months ago. Uh, I, I taught this course uh, in, in the spring semester and all the vic videos are on YouTube. So you can check out a lot about re like the theoretical methods of reinforcement learning in, in those videos. Uh, now I, I'll give you a, so this is an 8,000 level course. So the mathematical sophistication required to understand that course is like significant but I'm sure you can get something out of it if you're truly interested in reinforcement learning and are not fearful of seeing a lot of math. Uh, hopefully this, this course helped you 
get to a point where you are not really intimidated by seeing a lot of math on the blackboard. So if that is the case, you can go and check out my course on reinforcement learning and hopefully learn something useful for your future stuff. But the basis of reinforcement learning is dynamic programming. And we learned a great deal about dynamic programming in this class. OK. So it was a great fun. This would be the last lecture. As I mentioned, uh, uh, I won't be teaching the class on Wednesday and Friday. I've sent out an email uh, through Carmen Canvas. So you should have received it. Um, please do complete SEIs by the end of the uh, end of this week. I think SEIs will be off after the end of the week. So maybe Friday is the last day for submitting SEI. So please do that by Friday. And hopefully uh, we'll meet once again at a later date personally. So not, not over, over Zoom, but in person. And hopefully you will get to um, take new classes that I'll be teaching in the future. I am teaching a course on cybersecurity of autonomous. Oh no, I'm not teaching. I'm planning to teach a course on cybersecurity of autonomous systems in, in autumn of next year. So that's about nine months from now. So hopefully I might see some of you in that particular class in autumn of 2021. Uh, does that course have a course code? Sorry, does that course have a? Uh, code. Is it ECE or is it CSE? It'll be an ECE course. It's yeah. not yet, uh, you don't have a, a course name or number for it, I guess. Well, the course number is going through the university approval, but that course number would be ECE 5555. Okay. Yeah. But it hasn't been approved yet, so I really can't say for sure whether I'll be teaching it or not, but... Fingers crossed. Uh, yeah, it's in the process. And there is a high likelihood maybe 95% chance that I will, I will be teaching it in autumn of 2021. Okay, um, I'm gonna stick around, I'll stop the recording. I'm gonna stick around for any further questions. And if there are no questions, please feel free to drop off.